have like a list of little tasks that I need to get done around the house. And the one that never gets done, and I feel bad about it every day, I always think about it. It's whenever I put a porn on, I'm at the beginning of a wank. It's another fantastic day as a self-employed lady. <laughs> I think it'd take you seconds to put some blue tack or a bit of tape over the camera of your laptop, and you never do it. And one day, someone's going to hack into my laptop and steal footage of me wanking. That's the thing, yeah? <laughs> then it's career over or the start of a glorious new career. <laughs> this is what stops me doing it, I think. F f don't flatter yourself. Realistically, who is going to want to watch footage of a 33-year-old woman in full winter pyjamas? <laughs> Sheets pulled up to my chin because I'm a Catholic. <laughs> don't want Jesus to see. <laughs> Or my dead grandparents, dirty voyeurs. <laughs> <laughs> Triple chins, just... <laughs> Completely dead-eyed. <laughs> Who needs facial expressions, man? Facial expressions are for when you're with other people. <laughs> There's a market for that. There's a market for dead-eyed Scottish women in porn. I know it. Whenever I get asked to describe my comedy, I always say it's accessible, observational stuff, suitable for the whole family. Right? <laughs> then you start reading descriptions of yourself over the years. Mines are always consistent. They're always blunt, brutal, forthright. I don't read reviews, but I saw one by accident recently. It opened with, Fern Brady scares me. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice review. <laughs> Who's this scary woman they're talking about? I'm a lovable, nice girl. And I'd always wondered why people thought I was aloof. And then um, I was doing a show in Berlin and a woman came up to me at the end and she said, just so you know, your entire set is a description of a woman with Asperger's. You should look in it. <laughs> <laughs> One guy just laughed there like, oh, thank God, she realizes. <laughs> It was the 10th person that had said it to me, right? One of them was me in the mirror every day. <laughs> Looked in it, uh, started getting diagnosed. I'll be honest, guys, it's not a huge surprise. I've always felt like an alien trapped in a beautiful woman's body. <laughs> the rest of the show isn't a poignant unpacking of the diagnosis and how I came to terms with it, and then we all have a little cry. No. <laughs> I'll just tell you where it affects me, right? I thought it would be cracking to get to a point in comedy where people recognise you for your comedy and say they like your stuff. Then it started happening and I was like, oh, I forgot I don't have any social skills off stage. <laughs> a guy came up to me in the airport. He was like, hey, I've seen you on YouTube. I really like your stuff. In my head when this happens, I'm always like, ah, thank you so much. The way I responded to this guy, however, was by silently holding out both my hands <laughs> and holding both his hands and just smiling in his face <laughs> dementedly, like Kate Middleton when she meets a heroin addict at the opening of community centre. <laughs> Don't let that put you off chatting to me after. Just know I've been coached in how to talk to you <laughs> by my autism therapist, Jemima. <laughs> I'm not good at being diplomatic, that's my problem. And it led to me having my first scandal in comedy in the last year. Dead exciting to have a scandal as a comedian. Uh, mine started because I was doing some material about a political party called the DUP. Now, some of you know who they are. If you don't, uh, they're these Northern Irish Christian politicians. They hate women and gay people, even though their leader is a stone butch lesbian who doesn't realize she's gay yet. <laughs> um, her name is Arlene Foster. Gay marriage was illegal in Northern Ireland until I started touring this show. Coincidence? <laughs> um, I did some material about Arlene Foster saying she was a homophobe because she was secretly gay, and I then performed it on a little-known channel called BBC One. <laughs> <laughs> the BBC lawyers checked it. I thought I was fine. And then the programme came out two days later, and I was made aware of a newspaper story in the Belfast Telegraph, Protestant newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> 
This is for an American audience, but I couldn't help being like, we'll do some sectarianism for the Glasgow audience. <laughs> Belfast Telegraph did a newspaper story with the headline, the DUP demand an apology from the BBC over comedians' gay jibes. And then there was an unflattering picture of me. <laughs> I was very excited. <laughs> But my agent, Chris, he's always trying to control what I do on Facebook and Twitter because I'm what the industry would call a liability. <laughs> he got on the phone straight away. Don't get into an argument with these politicians. They're not messing about. They'll shoot your knees off. Stay off Twitter. <laughs> Stay off the internet for one day. OK, Daddy, I'll be good. <laughs> In my head, I'm like, I haven't felt this alive in years. <laughs> I guess off the phone. I went on Twitter immediately. I put up a link to the thing demanding I apologise to Arlene, and I wrote underneath, I will apologise to Arlene Foster as soon as she licks my vag and looks disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make no further comment to the press because I'm a very private person. 